Good evening. My name is Tom Duro, and I'm the Vice President of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. I'm also known as the Zoom guy, so I coordinate these uh, webinars that we hold monthly with my coworker, Don Schnitzler, also a board member. He's on the screen there. Um, I'd like to welcome you and tell you a little bit about the Forest History Association before we get tonight to tonight's webinar. You can see our mission up on the screen there. It's to inform, educate, archive, and publish. Uh, so we're uh, um, that's what we're all about. Uh, we've been around for quite a few years. Uh, and we would encourage you, our webinars are free, open to anybody to attend. And, uh, uh, but I would encourage you to uh, become a member of the Forest History Association and contribute to our work that you see on the screen. Uh, so I'm gonna turn the microphone over to my coworker, Don, to tell you a little bit about the uh, process for tonight and introduce our speaker. Okay, as Tom said, my name is Don Schnitzler. Everybody calls me Schnitz. Um, I am also a board member of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. And on behalf of the entire board, I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar. Um, to aid in the success of tonight's webinar, a couple little notes uh, just to make things run smoother. First off, uh, in or on the screen near the bottom is a little feature called the chat feature. If you have any questions that come up during the presentation by uh, B, feel free to type those into the chat feature. We'll hold all questions until the end, and then Tom and I will relay the questions to our speaker at the end of the presentation. If you're new to Zoom or if you have any problems while we're uh, going through the talk, use that same chat feature to reach out to Tom or I, and we will see what we can do to uh, correct any issues that might be turning up. We don't usually have any, so everybody should just relax with that. It should work fine. Uh, and then at the end of the webinar, there will be a brief survey shared with everyone. Uh, the, the survey has seven simple questions, and we really do appreciate you taking a few minutes to complete that survey form for us. Uh, this evening's presentation is called Strike, the Pinkerton Papers. Uh, when workers arrived at the Merrill Woodenware Mill on February 1st, 1920, they discovered that the mill's main drive belt had been slashed during the night. Fearing additional actions against the companies, local mill owners secretly sought help from the Pinkerton detective agencies. Reports written by Pinkerton agents who came to Merrill were just the starting point for the strike. Um, this presentation will take listeners from the initial union action through the aftermath of the strike. Our speaker tonight is B. Liebel, uh, a retired educator and public library director. She has been active uh, an active member of the Merrill Historical Society for 30 years and is a collections curator for the Society's Museum. B has written three books, uh, To Run Without Horses, a pioneer autoist memoir, 1906 to 1920, Fern Bisbee's Diary, The Taming of a Rip-Roaring Timber Town, One Family Story, and I tell uh, both of these stories kind of uh, tell that time garnered headlines in her adopted hometown, but that over the last century have kind of been forgotten. And then the third book is the one that we're going to be discussing or focusing on tonight's presentation, Strike the Pinkerton Papers, Industrial Espionage in 1920 at Merrill, Wisconsin. And like you, I'm eager to hear what B has to say, so I am pleased to turn this platform over to B for our presentation this evening. Thank you, B. Thank you, B. Um, you can share your screen now. I did want to say one thing I meant to say it during the introduction. I had a chance to visit the museum here the other day and purchase a book. And I gotta tell you, it's a real page turner. I've been enjoying it very much um, about halfway through. So that tells you just in a few days, it is interesting. And uh, I'd encourage people to visit the museum. It's a very nice museum. It has a very nice uh, forest history section. Uh, so I just wanted to say that before we turn it over to Bee and her presentation. Thank you very much.
thank you, Tom and Don, uh, very much for that nice introduction, and welcome to all of you listeners out there. Uh, I'm very happy to have a chance to share the uh, research I've done on this topic with you. Uh, continuing the introduction a little bit, Strike the Pinkerton Papers tells the story of the 1920 International Union of Timber Workers strike in the Merrill Mills. The starting point for the book was the collection of reports written by the Pinkerton Detective Agency operatives who came here. It is a story full of intrigue and subterfuge false identities, clandestine meetings, hidden agendas, and underhanded tricks. After all, the reports were written by industrial spies. Uh, I don't have time to cover everything in the book, um, but I wanted to give you a quick look at the table of contents, uh, just so you have an idea of oh, the... uh, Could you share your screen now so to get the presentation up? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were. Yeah. No, I, I just, yeah. It's not there. Not yet. Uh, no, wait a minute. Get out. Okay. I've lost your screen share opportunity. Where is it? Here. Share screen. There should be a green arrow at the bottom of the screen that says share screen. Okay, which I clicked on. So yep. do you and have it now? It's coming now. Okay, we'll go and back. Now you just have to go to from the or, um, right. slide. Got set. it. Okay. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right, as I was saying, um, this is uh, the table of contents, as you can see, and it, it just is kind of an outline of the book's contents. During the closing of Merrill's Anson and Gilkey Company operations in the late 1970s, an employee of the woodworking factory discovered a file of reports written in 1920 by Pinkerton Detective Agency operatives who were hired to infiltrate the International Union of Timber Workers Local 128 and to collect information for local manufacturers who feared a strike over the eight hour day. The reports were likely found there because George Gilkey, one of the mill owners in 1920, had been designated acting client and copies of the reports would have been sent to him. The 1970s mill employee, bless him or her, decided that the report should be preserved as a significant chronicle of local history and delivered them to the Merrill Historical Society. There they were cached in society archives in this plain unlabeled wooden box that was seldom open. The Pinkerton file is made up of 132 separate reports dated from February 23rd, 1920 through July 21st, 1920. The reports were written by the detectives and transcribed by various agency typists into 422 pages designated as file 244. So a little bit about the Pinkerton Detective Agency. In 1850, Alan Pinkerton left his job as Chicago's first police detective to form the eponymous agency which gained national attention when it foiled an assassination attempt on President Abraham Lincoln and then became legendary as they pursued Jesse James, the Younger Gang, the Dalton Brothers, and Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch. By the early 1890s, Pinkerton's agency had 2,000 active agents and 30,000 reserves. Causing the state of Ohio to outlaw the agency due to the possibility of being hired out as a private army or militia. During the labor riots of the 1800s, the agency began to align itself 
with management. Operative S H. A total of eight detectives came to Merrill between January and July. This slide doesn't show any of them. It just gives you an idea of the identification they carried. Now, depending on a person's attitude, the labor spy is, quote, the most degraded human specimen of society, or the labor spy represents, quote, the will of the community in preserving order, or the labor spy is merely quote, an entrepreneur who saw an opportunity to make money out of conflict. Regardless of the viewpoint, a large part of the manufacturer or mill owner's strategy involved use of detectives. Frequently, the spies were the smartest men in the locals and well enough educated to accomplish their purpose, which was to destroy the unions. The detective or operative that remained in Merrill the longest was named Op S.H. He was also the most successful because unlike some others, he had extensive experience in the lumbering field. The many reports he wrote reveal that he also had personal qualities that helped him become influential with other mill workers. He was well-educated, personable, persuasive, clever, outgoing, and determined. His military training came in handy too. Trouble had been brewing in the lumber related industries of the Great Lakes region for some time, primarily focusing on the desire of workers to reduce 10 hour workdays to eight hour days. But they were not alone in their desire to improve their lives. When the International Union of Timber Workers representatives voted in September of 1919 to strike for this cause, they joined a massive labor movement that included dozens of other unions from throughout the country. Unions representing workers from a, a wide variety of occupations who were dissatisfied with their working conditions following World War I. These included telephone operators, actors, miners, policemen, and many others. The situation was more complex than that. Women's suffrage, prohibition, and the Red Scare were additional issues facing Americans. Now, Tom has mentioned to me that uh, the subject of the Red Scare is of particular interest to him. So, uh, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about that. There were several factors that contributed to the Red Scare. First, by 1917, when America entered World War I, the private investigation business was thriving with thousands of agents at more than 300 firms, such as Pinkerton's. And there were even volunteer spies in organizations such as the American Protective League, hidden throughout American society. Second, the war prompted the passage of several pieces of legislation, including the 1917 Selective Service Act, the Espionage, Espionage Act, the Alien Act of 1918, that helped the government identify and eliminate troublemakers. What began as wartime measures to protect Americans in their own country and to outmaneuver German spies evolved into a homeland war waged against anyone who did not agree with what the government was doing, even if they were innocent citizens practicing their democratic right, protesting and speaking their minds. And third, the devastating Spanish influenza outbreak began to abate in early 1919. Fear of this fatal virus, however, began to be replaced by an almost hysterical dread 
that the violence and anarchy released released in Russia by the Bolshevik Revolution would, like the flu, also spread worldwide. Unlike the flu, which was indifferent to social class, the revolution targeted the affluent and people in positions of power, and 1919 saw the beginning of the fanatical Red Scare. The list of those considered suspicious was lengthy. Liberals such as Wisconsin Senator Robert M. La Follette, shown here, socialists, anarchists, pacifists, African Americans. Russians as well as Germans were high on the list because the government thought that Germany was behind the Russian Revolution. All labor organizers were targeted. The Pinkerton agents arrived in Merrill in early 1920 at the peak of the Red Scare. U.S. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, this is his picture, warned America's internal spies, such as the Pinkerton agents, to be particularly aware of foreigners, believing that they were controlled by Moscow and that they received orders directly from Lenin and Trotsky. Here is a description. Each and every adherent of this movement is a potential murderer or a potential thief. Out of the sly and crafty eyes of many of them leap cupidity, cruelty, insanity, and crime. From their lopsided faces, sloping brows, and misshapen features may be recognized the unmistakable criminal type. Well, with propaganda like this coming from the U.S. Attorney General's office, it's not surprising that Pinkerton agents were particularly wary of Russian immigrants who worked in the mills. Operative S.H., for example, in the 86 reports he filed, used the words radical and troublemaker and outlaw liberally, in addition to red and socialists. It doesn't appear that many, if any, of these men were actually members of any isms or guilty of anything other than wanting to provide for their families and improve their lives. But our Pinkerton spy was assiduously looking for suspects. This is, as you can see, <laughs> the red flag and foreign radicals uh, with industry uh, bearing down on them. Now, just, um, I wanted to include just this little uh, bit of information uh, that I call sawmill loggers compared to loggers, sawmill workers compared to loggers. This is, uh, a very biased summary of the differences between these two groups written by a man from uh, the industrial workers of the world, a competing union to that of the union we're talking about here in Merrill. But I think it, it adds a, in retrospect, a little piece of humor to this. Sawmill workers are characterized by the psychology of all factory workers almost always tired, trained to harsh discipline or content with low comfort. Factory life tends to dispirit and cow the workers who spend their lives in the mill's gloomy confines. But the logger, being consistently close to the great heart of nature, acquires the dignity and independence of the savage rather than the passive and unresisting submission of the factory worker. As I said, a, a biased people, and we'll leave it at that. The strike rationale. Author Anthony Reed has stated that the strikes were prompted by, quote, simple economics. Inflation had reduced the value of the $19.13 to 45 cents 
And while a cost of living for the average family was 99% higher than it had been five years before, wages had barely increased at all. Yet the lumber union's only official ask for the 1920 strike was the eight hour day. The union's official goals in striking for the eight hour day were, quote, not for selfish personal gain, not with desire to bring stagnation to industry, but because the members realize that the eight hour day means a longer life, a better fatherhood, a better motherhood, and a childhood that will live and develop into a generation of noble men and women the thing upon which this nation must depend if its democratic institutions shall live. Now in an April 29th ad, the lumber manufacturers stated their justification for not granting the eight hour day. Quote, there has not been a case in two years in any lumber mill in this district where the manager or superintendent or any official of that company has been asked by his employee, employees for the eight hour day. Evidently the men were satisfied or why did they not ask if conditions were such at this time that the eight hour day could be put into effect. Of course, the real fear was that if the union won the eight hour day, it would then want closed shop with everybody in the union. I have not found a photo of the 1920 strike. This is a photo of the 1892 mill strike in Merrill because that's as close as I could get. Many of the people, the men in this photo probably were fathers and grandfathers though of the 1920 strikers. And there were a couple of strike techniques that were used by both the union and the manufacturers. Both groups used local newspapers to disseminate information. And both used spies. So it was not just the manufacturers that used spies, but the, the union also had its spies. In addition, uh, the union instructed its members to never discuss the strike outside of the union hall. The union negotiated with grocers to give union members reduced prices and credit during the strike. And the union held dances to help keep spirits high. The mill owners hired the Pinkerton Agency, of course. They also brought in 25 men to be used by the mills as guards. And on the recommendation of Pinkerton agents, they circulated rumors to keep the strikers in turmoil. Of course, both groups had other techniques that are also discussed in my book. Now, what did members of the community think about this whole situation? Uh, the book lists 11 opinions. Um, of community members, three of them were pro-union. The rest didn't think that the strike would be successful. Uh, as an example, I show a picture of Merrill's West Side and a streetcar. Um, a streetcar operator said, we work 11 hours a day and get 55 cents an hour straight time. That isn't enough, but there aren't many jobs in town that pay more than that. On the east side, a grocer, a union member, supported union members by, as I said, selling them groceries at a reduced price and offering credit. And a billiard hall owner and cigar manufacturer named uh, Hayden Blair believed they were crazy for going out for all the manufacturers were prepared for the worst. He was very sorry for the boys, but they were starting something that they could not finish. 
Now, this is one of my favorite parts. The Women Speak Out. Pinkerton Agency recognized the importance of union members, wives, and mothers to the success or failure of a strike. Apparently, so did the mill owners. In early March, one of the owners mentioned using women operatives, which had been used by Pinkerton since 1856, spread anti-strike propaganda among mill workers' family members. Now, this ad obviously is not for Pinkerton agents, but I think it is interesting that there were other female detectives. The ad indicates the reason it was considered important to send women detectives. Local women would talk much more readily to another woman than they would to a man. This ad from the Navy Department shows another reason female detectives could be effective. An unknown woman was less suspicious than an unknown man would be. So two female detectives from the Pinkerton Agency were sent to Merrill in April of 1920. They conducted 79 conversations over a period of five days. No doubt the agents were smartly dressed, friendly women who gained entry into homes by offering to demonstrate a dietary supplement called chemo. Why would anyone have suspected that they were labor spies? I chose my idea of what a female Pinkerton agent might have looked like, how she may have gained the trust of local women, and why the locals might have been influenced by these professional looking women. <clears throat> so they talked to women who opposed the strike. Here are some examples of opinions uh, from these women. A non union wife said, He can make good money without helping to support a bunch of lazy men, that is, union officers and agitators. A widow said, it is the younger set of men who are causing this trouble. And the wife of a man who was not a mill worker said she thought the mill workers earned enough for a town this size. Quote, everyone has a garden and that helps so much. But there were women who favored the strike as well. A union man's wife said that's the only way for the men to get what's coming to them. The wife of a railroad worker said, the mill workers work just as hard, if not harder, than the railroad men and are entitled to the eight hour day. And two dressmakers said, we have to have the rich and the poor, but the rich are getting too rich. The little fellow is squeezed out. Now the female Pinkerton agents didn't hesitate to express their opinions of the women they interviewed. The women who favored the mill owners and were anti-strike were described in approving terms. Good-natured, motherly looking, sweet, intelligent, refined, neat, reasonable. But derogatory adjectives and phrases were often used for those who favored the union and the strike. Pro-German, of course, that was anathema so soon after the war bitter, illiterate, queer state of mind, heated, ignorant, a pretty stiff proposition. There were a number of anti-strike propaganda points the female detectives use. There were a number of anti-strike propaganda points the female detectives used, and this Peanuts cartoon nails one of them. <clears throat> to the wives of mill workers, agents said, stick to your job and the company. No doubt the company will do well by you if you are loyal and do not create any disturbances. And a scare tactic used by the, the women was understandably used more effectively with the women they talked to than with their husbands. Do you know 
who suffers the most in stripes? The wives and the children. I know a case in which the strike lasted so long, the mother had to go out washing. She happened to be quite frail. And after a short time, hard work. We returned to the ants and Gilkey and Herd Mill briefly. This mill stood out during the strike for a number of uh, reasons. Uh, the company distributed a pamphlet to its employees in early 1920, outlining a profit sharing plan that the local paper in its January 5th edition lauded as being a new idea, not just in Merrill, but in the state. An idea that would, quote, show in part the genuine honesty of the effort to grant to labor an equitable interest in the business and a certain return for honest and interested effort on its part. Whether this offer came from a feeling of magnanimity on the part of the manufacturer or, or was primarily an effort to avert the potential strike is debatable. Anson Gilkey employees who didn't strike were called scabs by strikers. The police chief stopped this action, which aggravated union members. The union consulted the district attorney, however, who told them it was illegal to use a term such as scab when addressing men who never belonged to the union. The Anson Gilkey profit sharing plan divided the net profits of the business profits of the business between the owners and the workers on the basis of 70% to the former and 30% to the latter. During the strike, one clause in the agreement to the effect that any man who went on strike would lose his right to share in the profits was perhaps the prime reason why the Anson Gilkey Company was the only mill that operated throughout the strike. Going to Operative SH's <clears throat> final report, back at, the work, back at work at the Woodenware Factory on July 21st, 1920, Operative SH wrote his final report summing up the results of his four months work in Merrill. There is an old saying, no news is good news, and it holds good in this instance. It is quite noticeable that the men attend to their work better than they did before the strike. Perhaps they are trying to make up for lost time. The radicals are working too long hours to think of agitating. And furthermore, they know there is no use for them to try. They know that the union has made its run and have not the heart to attempt anything for the eight hour movement. Now, personally, it amazes me that in a compilation written 60 years after the strike and titled, entitled Memorable Dates of Merrill, Wisconsin, local author Clarence Stiza made no mention of either the 1892 strike or the 1920 strike. Yet the earlier action had gained the 10 hour workday for strikers and the 1920 strike could well have affected half of the population of the city directly. How quickly. I'm going to uh, share with you uh, several quotations from written by men who were more intimately knowledgeable about life in the mills and about the life, the lives of mill workers than I am. Uh, because I think they uh, they really bring clear pictures uh, to mind. Certainly they do for me. Uh, the first one is about the, the mills themselves. The symphony of sawmill whistles at five o'clock in the morning summoned the workers to the beginning of the day's work at 6 a.m. 
the early residents of Merrill could call by name every one of the whistles of each of the eight sawmills along the river. And then I'd like to uh, read something about the mill workers. <clears throat> Nearly everyone caught a speck of sawdust beneath his eyelid and swore every time he blinked that a dagger had been thrust into his retina. Sawdust found every crevice and lined every collar like fur. It clumped in heaps and clung in every weary man's mustache, which is how sawdust smiles. For those who insist on knowing how much swearing went on inside a sawmill, the matter is simple. Get to know a current or former sawmill worker, then count up the number of times he swears or curses in a casual conversation and multiply it by 30. And on Friday afternoons, we gathered outside the office door to watch the new man open his first pay envelope, just to see how far his jaw dropped with disbelief that he could work so hard for so little reward. And finally, a quotation I just happened across and thought that it was appropriate for the Forest History <clears throat> Association. If you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You are a leaf that doesn't know it is part of a tree. That's from author Michael Crichton. And I guess I'll open it for questions. Sorry, I had to find my mute button. Uh, thank you very much, B. Uh, first question out of the rocks is how do you get a copy of the book? <laughs> oh, very easily. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, they are available on uh, or through our website, discovermerylhistory.org. Uh, and uh, my friend and colleague, Pat, who's here with me, uh, takes care of, of those orders along with Brandon, our, our other helper. I did uh, drop the web address into the chat function so people can pick it up there. Um, so as and I, I always get the privilege to ask my questions first because I'm moderating. Uh, but I, I was wondering, you know, all of the operatives. The, I assume that that is it have like code names. Was were there any real names in the paper, or was it all code? Yeah, they were all code names. Um, no, there even in the in the reports there was never a, a person's real name. Uh, no. Yeah, obviously they posed as workers, so mm -hmm. and infiltrated the union halls and discussions and stuff like that. It was really been very interesting. Uh, I should look in the chat here and find another question now that I got my question answered. There's one of the questions and answers uh, section uh, from Tom Cole. He asked if it uh, basically says languages languages were spoken in lumber camps, different languages were spoken in lumber camps and mills in the late 1800s and communication could be a problem. In the 1920s, was this also true? Did you uh, have anything, B? Uh, I believe that was true to some extent, perhaps not quite as much as in the 1800s. But uh, in terms of the Russian uh, men that uh, the operatives was writing about in particular, he, he didn't mention how many Russian uh, workers there were, but there were enough that the union had uh, an interpreter that they could use to translate the, the Russian speaker's language. And uh, operative SH himself kind of complained about the fact that, that this man didn't speak English and he, but he would sit by himself and kind of mumble and laugh and whatever. And it, it kind of frustrated 
the operative that he couldn't understand what the man was saying. So the last part of his question uh, it asks, uh, could it have been an impediment to the union organizing? And so probably the answer is yes for that. Well, um, to some extent, probably. Uh, as I said, I, I'm thinking just about what I know about the situation myself. Uh, in the, There were, of course, in Merrill, as in most places, maybe all places, um, people from from all over the world who came here to settle. And but uh, we're talking about 1920, not 1880. And I think that while I, I picture many, many different um, kinds of, of uh, accents that perhaps uh, also many of the people who had come to this country in the 1800s by that time uh, were relatively fluent in English. That's just my my opinion based on uh, on what I've read. But... I, I do know that in places like Point, they published uh, Polish newspapers well into the 1950s and 60s. So language was an issue but uh, most people, like you said, B, I think by 1920 were at least learning rudimentary English. Right. Uh, I there were Germ there were a couple of German newspapers here, um, but I they were they were no longer being uh, published in the 1920s. And but I do know that some of the churches had German language um, services until, as you say, into the 50s and perhaps even a bit later than that. The other thing, uh, and you talked about it, you know, the Red Scare, and it uh, was not just the uh, Russians that uh, were, you know, suspect of being Bolsheviks, uh, but there were, you know, the Finnish people came from a social, socialized country. And I know uh, in other lumber strikes, you know, there was some discrimination based on a person's origin and whether they came from a communist or socialistic country or not. Are you right? <laughs> I, um, I, I did one more thing I might mention. <clears throat> the strike here ended in July. Uh, we have in our museum a sign that was posted in uh, the Merrill Woodenware Company, which was one of the mills for the strike place. This was posted um, oh, about seven months after the strike was over. And it says, notice to employees, on account of decline in prices on candy pails and lard tubs, we are again obliged to make a reduction in wages. Common labor will be 30 cents per hour, others in proportion. Take effect Monday, February 21st, 1921. I think it's interesting that's <laughs> today's date, February 21st. Uh, but a few or some of the mills had given workers small wage increases during the strike. Uh, and But as this indicates, <laughs> Uh, probably that didn't remain in effect uh, after the strike was over for a very long. Uh, this question is probably a, a dissertation, but uh, did you say that there were 80, uh, hold on, two questions here, I'm mixing them up. How common were the labor strikes in the early 20th century? And like I said, that's probably could be a dissertation mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there were hundreds, if not thousands of strikes in 1919 going into 1920. As I said, any almost any type of business you can think of uh, from telephone operators 
to actors, to policemen, that there were just strike after strike after strike, some of them terribly violent. And one of the um, uh, hallmarks, I think, of the strike here, perhaps because there had been enough strikes where violence had been a problem, uh, here, both the union and the mill owners made a point that they did not want violence. And there was, in fact, very little violence. Uh, even there were a few mill workers who um, were a bit threatening, but they really, I, really, one of the worst things that happened was that a couple of younger uh, mill workers threw eggs at uh, an, an older worker. I mean, it was just, there just was very little in the way of violence. And, and that was uh, pointed out by Operative SH as, as being one of the features of this strike. Certainly there was violence though in the labor movement, you know, all the way into the 1930s and 40s. Um, uh, I told Leah that I've uh, done a fair amount of research on the 1937 timber, timber uh, it was actually in the lumber camps across the UP and into northern Minnesota. And in Michigan and Wisconsin, the, the strikers were put down violently. Uh, but in Minnesota, they actually uh, uh, won their fight for a union and uh, unionized the uh, logging camps. Unfortunately, about that time, uh, most of the company-owned logging camps were phased out and they went to jobbers who did the logging rather than having company-owned logging camps. But it's probably another topic for another webinar. <laughs> Uh, did you say that there were eight mills in Merrill and how long did the sawmills continue? Well, the sawmills continued here. Um, it was kind of a, a process of uh, segueing from mills into other businesses. Um, the mills went on as long as they could, some of them into the 20s, even the 1930s. But some of them uh, burned eventually, and, and that was a point at which they uh, either changed uh, to doing some other kind of work or, or just went out of business altogether. I think there was one business up to the 70s even. Um, oh. Yeah, but um, as I said, many of them started making other products, windows and doors, which are still being produced here. Uh, at one point, there was something called House of Merrill. They built uh, homes for people. Uh, some of them had toys that they made. And so just a variety of products that, that they could make when the, the, the lumber, uh, had gone in some respects. The, the forests around here had been, uh, well, decimated, <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. And also, so... <laughs> also had a, a paper mill, which, you know, lasted for into the 80s or 90s, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a common thread across the Wisconsin River Valley where you started out with sawmills and, and eventually went to paper and then uh, even the paper has been on a bit of a decline, so. Yes, our, yeah, our mill has been closed for quite a while now. I think you're right, the 70s. Uh, this, the strike here, um, another point that I found interesting, uh, the operative wrote that the strike would never officially be called off by the union because if a vote was taken throughout the district, the majority of the men striking would vote to go to work. 
the strike leaders knew this and were aware that it would be impossible to vote for another strike after the men got through. So um, they never had an official vote to end the strike. It just kind of faded away. Yeah. But there was never another strike either. How long did it last? It wasn't very long, was it? No. Beginning of May to the middle of July. Yeah. And it, from the very beginning, it was, I guess I'd say kind of a half-hearted strike. Um, there was uh, this emphasis on no violence and um, men were supposed to uh, go out and um, go on, go on, on uh, what did they call Picket it? Line. Picket line. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> my, my brain freeze. Um, uh, picket lines, but they didn't seem to really want to do this. There, there was a certain amount of it, particularly early on in the strike, but but it was never a huge thing. And uh, the operatives told later on about how they maybe see one guy standing near a mill and just kind of doing nothing. <laughs> it really, as I said, half-hearted kind of is a, is a word that I applied to this strike. Did they receive strike pay from the um, union? Eventually, I believe they received some. It didn't happen until uh, at least midway through May. And I know some of the strikers had expected to receive a weekly allowance. And I don't know that that happened. Uh, if it did, um, it really wasn't mentioned that they got something that regular. So, they didn't you know, have a lot of money. <laughs> they didn't really have a big <laughs> war chest, I will say that. Which might have been, you know, a motivating factor for getting back to work so they could get a regular paycheck. Correct. All right. I don't well, see anything like else, said, Tom. Go ahead, Don. No, I was just going to say, I don't see anything else, Tom. Okay. I would encourage everybody to make a visit to the Merrill Historical Museum, it's an amazing place. Like I said earlier, they have a great uh, little section on forest history. Uh, some great uh, log stamps there that I saw and some other uh, logging tools, uh, very well displayed and, and a really nice facility. So I'd encourage you. And while you're there, you can pick up one of uh, B's books. So anything what, else from you, B? Well, um, I just wanted to show you my other two books, if I can. Sure. Uh, this is To Run Without Horses, and it's a, it's a very colorful book. And you can see I've used postcards to illustrate this book. Uh, but it's the story of the first auto dealership in Merrill, and, uh, which opened in 1908. And... Um, I'm, I really functioned more as an editor of this book than, than the actual writer because uh, Norman Shilson, the man who owned the auto dealership, was an excellent writer. And uh, I, I kind of took <laughs> what he wrote and just uh, organized it a little differently. And as I said, added the, the postcards, but I, I think it's a fun book. And then um, Vern Bisbee's Diary, it's my third book. It's kind of long, tall, so you can't see it. But uh, this tells the story of uh, the Bisbee, Harvey, Erickson families who came to Merrill uh, in the early 1880s, right after, after the railroad came to Merrill and Merrill really started to boom. Uh, and um, they moved into the area of town, of course, that was growing the most rapidly, which is the 
bloody sixth ward <laughs> and perhaps other towns had had uh, parts of their city too that were uh, a little bit rough around the edges because uh, well there were lots of people pouring into town and uh, and uh, looking for work and so forth uh, but uh, again this one was based on a diary written by a young woman named Fern Bisbee who grew up in the sixth ward with her family. So thank you for letting me do my little commercial. <laughs> All right, we have a comment, uh, a couple comments now uh, saying thank you for a great presentation. So uh, I wanna make sure that you knew right away that there are people enjoyed this presentation. I certainly did. And I wanna thank you for attending, everyone that's there yet, attending tonight's webinar. Also want to remind you that you'll be getting this survey right after you close or leave the webinar. Uh, seven simple questions. We do appreciate you to answer it. And then next month, we're going to have a talk. It's the 75th anniversary of the Sand County Almanac. And so the executive director from the Aldo Leopold Foundation will be talking to us about the land ethic and a Sand County Almanac, the making of a movement. Uh, if you want to register now, you can just go to the Forest History Association of Wisconsin's website and click on the link. Otherwise, a reminder will come out a couple days or a week to a couple days before the presentation saying that it's going to be on uh, Wednesday, March 20th at 630. Okay, thank you again, Tom. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you, B. You're welcome.